everybody, and welcome back to the Dash Trader Newsroom. And this uh, particular um, issue is about the CFO survey, which sees a recession in our future uh, for Q1 of 2023. The big question on everybody's mind uh, today in the trading markets and this week is, is this a recession unavoidable or is there something that the Fed could do um, to avoid um, what the CFOs uh, around the nation of our largest corporations uh, see in the not so distant future. So that's the big question of today. My name is Michael DeJoyer. I'm the Director of Educational Services here at Gas Trader. I'm also a licensed professional. Uh, I've been trading markets uh, for many, many years, and I'd like to share with you some of my uh, interpretation and experience um, you know, in doing so. So let's just jump right in and talk a little bit about the uh, the news today and, and over the last couple of weeks. Um, so basically new mortgage rates have dropped to the lowest level since 20, uh, in lowest level in 22 years. So new mortgage application rates have dropped to the lowest level in, in what is 22 years. And that's because interest rates are rising and are continuing to rise and are expected to continue to rise. Um, we have a, a Federal Reserve interest rate decision coming out um, next week. I believe it's on the 15th. And uh, you know it's expected that the Fed will raise interest rates by 50 basis points. And uh, that 50 basis point rate hike would be the third rate hike this year. First was a 25 uh, basis point hike uh, back in January, then last month or slightly before last month. But at the last rate decision uh, meeting at the FOMC, they raised another 50 basis points. That kind of triggered uh, a further sell-off in the markets. Uh, but pretty much this has been one of the worst starts of the year. Um, I mean, in many, many years, I think it's almost 40 years um, that we haven't had a, a start to a year be quite so bearish. Um, but certainly the market has put in a low, and we're going to go to the charts a little bit later on in today's session. But let's talk a little bit about U.S. weekly jobless claims. They hit 229,000, and uh, that's the highest rate since January. Um, and this is, this is helping to feed the expectations of the uh, oncoming recession. Now, what happens in a, an economy when you start to... Um, when you start to raise interest rates is that uh, companies start to shed jobs and they, that leads to demand destruction, which helps bring down the demand, um, which therefore decreases inf inflation, um, or at least that's how it's all supposed to work. So, so an increase in job claims is not a big surprise. It's actually expected um, after two rate hikes and potentially a third coming next week. Uh, but certainly uh, people who think that their jobs are in the bag or have or that the market, the job market is so tight, uh, which is one of the things that the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman has said um, you know, numerous times, that we have a very, very tight jobs market. And therefore, um, it is expected that the, um, you know, that, that the economy can handle the interest rate hikes. And therefore, he was hoping that we could have a soft landing. But now if uh, CFOs are saying that they see recession in the cards, that leads us to believe that the soft landing is not quite so possible. And even I believe the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell himself has indicated that um, his, uh, you know, his previous expectation for a soft landing may have been a little bit um, hopeful at the, at the least. And certainly even Janet Yellen has come out saying that uh, her belief that inflation was transitory was based on um, the pandemic. And obviously the pandemic has kind of continued to linger on and therefore the inflation that was related to the pandemic was not so transitory. Um, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, disheartening um, as a market participant uh, because you're supposed to, you know, expect that the federal reserve is going to do its job, which is keep inflation in check. Um, and, um, and certainly um, it's now very difficult to, um, to kind of get a gauge on the market because good news is bad news, bad news is good news. So if the inflation number comes out hot tomorrow um, and the job number comes out hot tomorrow, um, 
maybe the Fed won't be so aggressive in raising interest rates. So it, it kind of gets the market starts to expect things that would normally be bad news now becomes good news because it will cause a reaction or a change in judgment or a change in expectation from, from what the Federal Reserve uh, Bank is going to do. So it gets a little bit hard, uh, almost like it's like almost like uh, double negatives um, when speaking English. Um, they, it becomes a, it becomes a positive when you have a double negative. So this is what we're all watching and waiting for. Um, certainly, we saw uh, you could see in the markets today that the U.S. market is waiting for the key interest rate decision. Um, the ECB, the European Central Bank, came out and confirmed its 50 basis point rate hike. Um, and, uh, and thus, the European markets were all down um, today uh, pretty significantly. And, um, you know, we'll take a look at, you know, various different charts uh, once we go to the charts. But certainly that has, um, you know, been on everybody's mind and, um, you know, has led us to, uh, to this point where uh, we're all just kind of waiting to see what the Federal Reserve is going to do. Certainly, you have to be aware that the Federal Reserve raising interest rates by 50 basis points, that'll take us to 1.25 um, interest rate, Federal Reserve, uh, you know, Fed funds rate. And uh, that is the key interest rate that uh, the Federal Reserve rent lends to other banks. And then obviously banks put it out at higher rates. Um, that obviously is what is affecting the mortgage rates. That is also obviously what's affecting the financial markets. And, um, and certainly, you know, you go down from company to company to company to um, small cap companies are the most interest rate sensitive. Uh, technology companies tend to have a lot of debt, therefore they are very interest rate sensitive. Um, and then blue chip companies are, are the least because they have, you know, large, um, you know, international operations. They have a lot of, usually a lot of cash on hand so that they don't need to use um, borrowed money so much. Um, but certainly all companies have, uh, have, you know, interest rates have an effect on the money supply across the entire system. So it's a tightening of the money supply. Um, so let's, let's jump right to the charts. So I'm jumping right to my Dash Trader. I'm just going to increase the size of my, uh, of my primary chart that we're looking at. And the market is still open today. And I want to give a special note that um, this is recorded on a Thursday and is released generally on a Friday. So again, some of the things that I'm talking about, you know, we're waiting expectantly for the, um, for the jobs number and the inflation numbers tomorrow. So we have not gotten those numbers yet. Um, we do give out um, little, you know, market blurbs on the, um, on the Instagram and social media updates that Das Trader puts out. So certainly stay attuned to those, but certainly be aware that this is recorded usually uh, the afternoon before the date it's released. And that just gives time for editing and whatnot. Um, so, so here we are, this is the, um, the chart of the S&P. I mean, this, this is the epitome of a downtrend. Um, this is the SPY, which follows the, um, you know, which follows the, uh, the S&P 500 index. So I'm just gonna do a, a trend line right. And here it is. There's another trend line here. Just going to show you that. So that's the, um, the the prevailing trend so far is down. Okay. And here's another trend line. Just going to say if this if this current lower high holds, what we see is a steepening of the downtrend. Now, what we would be looking on the on the bullish side, okay. This consolidation here would certainly be a potential lower high. And I'm, I'm gonna just, I don't usually go in these sessions into the intraday charts. It's gonna go a little bit further uh, back. Let's just see, let's go back. Data config. I'm gonna go six, I'm gonna go, let's just go a little bit further. I'm gonna go back to uh, five. Uh, 15, let's see, 515. So here, if you look at this, this, this has a little bit of an element. If it breaks this, this horizontal support level, okay, this horizontal line here, okay, which we are right at support 
um, here on thir uh, Thursday at 244. We are right at support. Uh, you know, this is the bounce or break level for the S&P. If it's going to break, it needs to break that 406, you know, 407 number. Um, it needs to break below here and close below here. Um, if it is going to break to the upside, it needs to, needs to break out of this consolidation. And I'm just going to use, again, a regular trend line for this one just to kind of indicate that there's a kind of horizontal level of, of resistance here at around 415 up to about 417. So this is the key area and the key range that the market is, is trading between. And it really is at a point where it could break down or bounce up. And it would, this would be the key level that you would expect the bounce to come off of. Now, if we get a rally here for the last hour and 45 minutes of the day, hour and 15 minutes of the day, rather, um, then that would be pretty bullish. That would be, um, you know, pretty, um, you know, it would indicate that, that there still are some buyers out there hoping for the best um, going into the, uh, the inflationary number and the, um, you know, and the jobs number. Um, now, certainly when that number comes out, it's anybody's guess which way it's going to be interpreted because of all the reasons I just stated, which is that the you know, up is down, down is up, good is bad, bad is good in trying to interpret, in, interpret what the Fed is going to do based on if the inflation number comes out hot or not. Um, again, the inflation numbers, because of the way that inflation is calculated these days, they tend to come real inflation, meaning that what you and me as consumers feel is far greater than the actual percentage that um, the Federal Reserve operates off of because it doesn't include, um, you know, uh, rents, for instance, which have you know gone up, you know, quite precipitously, um, and it doesn't include a lot of other things. So, th so the basket of items that they use to calculate these inflationary numbers is not really complete. Um, so that's another very very important factor. But, but needless to say, that number is expected tomorrow. And we are at a point where we, if we go down, we break down. If we bounce off this level, that's very, very bullish. And I'll show you why it's, it's well, it's not very, very bullish, but it's bullish. Um, but certainly you can see that it would probably lead to a run back up to you know, this level of resistance here at, at 427. And that lines up with this other trend line. And that as of right now, this little move up is a one, two consolidation, and then three move up, which would put this exactly where you would expect it to be from a technical perspective. Um, so we do have a little bit of mixed signals as far as what the market is saying it might do versus what the fundamentals are um, let me just see something interior color. Let's just see. Okay, let's see. Okay, perfect. So here we go. Um, that this would be the one, and then of course, if you take this and drag this up from here, that would put us even beyond um, you know that level, which would which would be around the four twenty seven level, which is where I think it might get to. That's probably just because of this long bottoming tail. Um, but needless to say, you get the point that it's a one, two, three, possible one, two, three continuation play. All right, so let's jump to the, um, the QQQ because the Qs have been a little bit different um, than the S&P, but you can see there's a very similar pattern. Let's just go a little bit further back. We'll look at the daily. The daily, you can see the, the Qs, which is the NASDAQ 100 average, um, you know, ETF that represents the NASDAQ 100. The Qs basically um, are in a downtrend. They are sloping down, making lower lows. We try to go higher. In, in one way, the Qs are a little bit more bullish than the, um, than the SPY in that um, it's above, it's above um, both the 10 and the, the 20 has gone a little bit below. But, but needless to say, you could see that we've pulled back into the moving averages. I'm going to add one more moving average here, study config. I'm going to add a moving average, just as regular moving average is being added. And I'm going to make it a 50, 50 period moving average. And I'll leave it not as blue. I'm going to make it a nice purple, just to stand out from the blue 
on the 20. So here it is. So, so that would make sense if we did get a rally out of this level, it would bring us to 320. Now a little bit more interesting, right? And a little bit more um, possible potentially would be, so let me just draw a horizontal line from here. So you could see that we have like kind of a, a confluence uh, between 320 on the 50 period moving averages location and 330, which is the top of horizontal resistance from the last consolidation. And I want you to see this little consolidation right here. See how it's consolidated little, if we call that a congestion of price, just like we have a congestion of price here, this congestion of price put in the low of the market. So we have a little congestion in price. If we rally out of this congestion of price, then it would take us to the next congestion in price, which is 328. I would say that when we go to the 60 minute chart, and we zoom in a little bit, you can see that we're not quite so much at the bottom of the range on the NASDAQ. So on the Qs, we are not quite as near the break point as on the S&P. And again, when we go to the DIA, which even though a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, professionals are saying that the DIA is not quite so relevant as it doesn't really represent, the US economy is not really very industrial. It was not just solely industrial like it once was. The Dow Jones was a really good indicator of the you know, breadth of the economy when the US was mainly an industrial manufacturer. But these days we're more of a service and technology um, you know, or consumer-based economy um, than, a, um, you know, than an industrial economy. So certainly you can see here, we have this, this very, very solid consolidation. We are looking a little bit bullish, uh, bearish rather, um, the way that we've been trading down in the last you know, couple of days here, but we are stuck in this consolidation. I'm going to um, go right here. So you can see we kind of broke the, the, um, the diagonal level of support. And I'm just gonna put in a horizontal level of support. So the horizontal level, we're still a little far off on the Dow, 325, we're at 327. So, you know, you got a little bit of space there and there's a little bit of play because we have a bottoming tail here. In true technical breaks, you'd want it to pass and close below the bottoming tail um, or the bottoming wick of that candle, which is the low of the range. But from an early indication, we are testing the low of this range, which is slightly bearish. Now, the nature of this range is a little bit bullish because it's fairly low volume. If you notice down here, there's low volume. And you can see that this range um, is tightening um, until these last couple of bars. And a lot of times, right before a breakout, you will get that last fake down retest possible failure that will lead to a further breakout um, thereafter. So that is, uh, that's the story for the, uh, the uh, intraday charts for the, and the daily charts of the SPY, QQQ, and the DIA. Let's go to um, GBTC. Okay, so Bitcoin certainly um, has been beaten up. Um, we can see that Bitcoin uh, GBTC, which is the ETF what, that represents Bitcoin, certainly is more bearish uh, from a relative strength perspective. It is more bearish than the DIA, the SPY, and the QQQ. Um, so cryptocurrency is really taking it on the chin, specifically this one, which represents Bitcoin. And Bitcoin really is the, the biggest, most dominant cryptocurrency. Um, did try to get a little bit of a rally up, um, but it seems like that rally has failed. ETHE represents Ethereum. It's the second um, you know, most commonly uh, traded coin. Ethereum is a, 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 you know, another cryptocurrency. It is also down quite considerably. Um, gold, we call gold the old man because it was the currency before we moved to a floating currency system in the, after the Bretton Woods conference. Um, and we went off, um, you know, we went off the gold standard and went to a floating currency system where economies and governments represent the strength of the currency. Um, and certainly you can see gold is holding its own. It's sort of put in a little bottom here after being up 
you know, quite considerably going into the, uh, the start of the, the war in Ukraine. I think that was around here. And then it broke out, went a little bit higher, got sold into, um, and then now it's just kind of been consolidating and kind of forming a bottoming power, a pattern rather. Um, silver tends to trade like gold. Like I always say, just it's stronger in precious metal bull markets. It's weaker in precious metal bear markets. So silver also, um, you know, holding up pretty well at around, um, you know, uh, 20.09 on the SLV, which is the silver ETF. Now, the big news is uh, Amazon AMZN, um, you know, had a, a, a massive split. And it, you know, certainly made a little run up into the split. And then certainly now it is pulling back. Now, what tends to happen for the, in the options market is when a big company like Amazon splits, it makes it way more attractive for option speculators to gamble on. I mean, I, it basically is speculation on the price of the stock. So the most active uh, contract um, for the last, you know, four days or so has been Amazon, which it, it supplanted um, Apple. Uh, but look, if you look at Amazon's chart, it's in a downtrend. And, and I, I will say that, that there's a reason for that. Uh, fundamentally, there's a reason for it is Amazon has extremely thin margins. And, um, you know, it, it makes money, you know, basically on delivery and you know, delivery costs are going up because of the price of fuel, um, as well as the price of all of those products are being increased due to inflation. And Amazon, because it has very thin margins, 10 to 15, less than 10 to 15% margins in terms of profits, um, doesn't leave it a lot of room to compensate and make money in, in very inflationary times like, like these. Um, so that's the reason why Amazon is a little bit more bearish um, than most of the other market after having done incredibly well during the pandemic. So let's go to the, um, the formerly most active trading stock, which was Apple. Um, so Apple was the most uh, commonly traded uh, options contract almost every day. I say almost every day because, you know, it's not every day. Uh, but certainly Apple um, has put in a bottom and has, you know, consolidated very similar to the way the markets have consolidated. It did not break out to the upside, but it, it does look like an inverted head and shoulders. Here's the shoulder, there's the head, and there's the shoulder. Um, so that is a somewhat bullish pattern. It is a very similar pattern to what we see on the QQQ. It's not surprising, although the Qs are a little bit more bullish because it has a strong right shoulder. So you see the shoulder down here goes to a double bottom almost. And then here, the shoulder has not gone down to retest. So Apple is a, a very, very large component of the QQQ. Certainly, it makes up a portion of the, um, the SPY as well. But Apple looking you know, pretty good if it can not let 144 get violated and broken. Um, so you know, if Apple does manage to rally and if the markets do manage to rally um, after tomorrow's numbers and after next week's federal interest rate decision, um, certainly this is a usually considered a bullish pattern. But the completion of this pattern would be a break past um, 152, which would be called the neckline break. So that would be the neckline. I'll just put it on the charts here. This would be the neckline break here. So a break of 151 slash 50 or 151 in general and a close above 151.50 would be considered a neckline break closed with confirmation. So that would be a pretty bullish indication. Um, for Apple. But again, that's a long way off. We're at 145. But again, with the, all the news that's pending and the interest rate decision, anything is possible. You know, nobody has a crystal ball. It's all about how market, you know, market participants interpret it. Now, if you notice, look back here, this is a very, very steep bull, uh, bear market rally. So we have not had a very steep bear market rally, but that is certainly possible in bear markets. Bear market rallies tend to be steep and violent, um, meaning that they go up very sharply and very quickly. Um, certainly, we're, we're, we're all waiting and watching um, for these numbers to come out um, up until next week when the Fed, Fed uh, makes its next announcement. And remember, it's not just the next announcement because the, the minutes 
come out one month after the announcement. So they make the announcement and then you have to wait a month and then you get the minutes from the meeting, which gives you further indication as to how they feel the country is dealing with inflation, how the country is dealing and the economy is dealing with, you know, possibly, uh, you know, people losing their jobs and possible demand destruction. MSFT. So Microsoft also has this similar pattern. Microsoft mirrors the, um, the QQQ more precisely than, um, than, than Apple does. Um, but, but Microsoft also a juggernaut as far as the market goes. Um, you know, Netflix, since its last earnings report has kind of been a dog. I mean, it's, you know, in some, some market participants would say that it's basically become like a utility, um, that all of the growth prospect is kind of out of it. Um, and I can completely understand that, um, you know, if you get to a certain level of subscription subscribers, it's, you know, and that's most of the globe or whatever, um, you know, there's no place to go but down. And that's somewhat the reason why the chart looks the way it does, which is very bearish. Um, Ford, a stock that we don't normally look at, um, you know, has been touted quite a bit, although it is down off its highs very considerably. It's almost half the price that it was going into the beginning of the year. Um, but needless to say, Ford um, has made some significant ground against, you know, Tesla. Um, Tesla certainly has that same kind of head and shoulders pattern that we saw in the NASDAQ. And certainly, you know, Tesla is one of these cult following stocks uh, where like everybody who loves Tesla, like they love Tesla, they love Elon Musk and, they, you know, they just, they're, uh, you know, acolytes of, of Tesla and Elon Musk. But certainly Tesla, um, you know, it, it was holding up really, really well. Um, but then since its last big rally and that bear market rally, um, it sold off pretty considerably making a new low. And then now it's showing those signs of, again, this inverted head and shoulders pattern. Um, now, mind you, if an inverted head and shoulders pattern forms, it's a very complicated pattern. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 days worth of bars, be 20 days of trading activity creating this pattern. If it goes to fruition, it's a very powerful pattern. If it fails, it is also a very powerful pattern. Meaning if people see that the inverted head and shoulders forming and then it doesn't come to completion, there will be a lot of disappointment if there is a breakdown um, and the, the, the minutes and news, um, you know, uh, the Federal Reserve interest rate decision, the inflationary number and the jobs number, if they come out negative and are interpreted negative, then that these will sell off because of the expectations that have now been dashed. They will sell off pretty considerably. Now, the last couple of things I'd like to go to is, uh, is take a look at is USL, which is the 12 month oil futures contract, uh, oil contract, it, it buys 12 months of oil futures. I mean, it's a big, huge, um, you know, bear, a bull pennant. And I'm just going to use um, trend lines to illustrate the bull pennant that we had pointed out previously. And here is the bull pennant. We broke out of this pattern. Here's the breakout. Here's the breakout of the pattern. Okay. And we've gone up. We've made a considerable run up to 45, um, hit 45.50. And we've kind of, kind of leveled off. This, this is one way that you can trade, um, you know, oil um, as is it, it is an ETF that trades the futures contract. There is USO, which is the more day trading variety of this. Um, it, it kind of close, more closely mirrors the price of oil um, for day trading purposes. And then this is the oil ETN, OIL, which is an ETN, which again, also mirrors the price of oil. And you can see all the charts are pretty similar. This is UNG, an ETF, okay? UNG, an ETF that um, basically shows natural gas. And you can see we've had tremendous volatility. Um, it had been at the highest 32. It sold off down to 27, bounced back up. 
So natural gas has certainly been um, something we've all been talking about with you know, Russia and the European dependency of natural gas. So certainly there's been a lot of volatility in natural gas. And that, is, that, that trend though, if you do your trend lines, which is your job as a trader and as an investor is to do your research and your, and your technical analysis, um, let's delete that. You can see the overall direction of this trend is clearly up. So you look at that overall, you wanna buy closer if you are going to buy this, you want to buy closer to the lower range of that trend and you want to sell towards the higher range of that trend. Now you can't pick tops and bottoms, but you want to buy somewhere down here and sell somewhere up there. And that's kind of the, the point of this. All right. So with that all being said, we've gone through oil, gas, gold, silver, the three major market indices, um, a couple of things that I would point out here is EWZ. Um, this is the, uh, the Brazil index, um, you know, made a huge shoulder, head, and possible shoulder. Um, you know, sold off pretty deep. I'm, I'm not really sure the reason for that. Generally, Brazil does well um, when there's uh, increasing commodity prices. It's a commodity uh, economy. EWA, uh, which is Australia, um, also took that big gap down. And I believe that has to do with um, the dollar strengthening. So as you raise interest rates, the dollar gets stronger against these other currencies and against commodities, and that will cause um, that kind of a big gap overnight. Um, so certainly be aware of, um, of that when you're trading these international ETFs that those gaps can be created because of currency change. So that covers all the major charts. I'm going to just transfer my screen back. All right, so that's it for market analysis. And um, for all of your updates on uh, with DAS, uh, you can stay up to date with all things DAS by signing up to our monthly newsletter and emails. I mean, we have given some really, really good, um, you know, some, some good you know, indications of where the market was going and what you can do to prepare for volatility as well as just, just giving some good analysis um, you know, over the last two years. Um, we've made some really, really um, amazing mentions like indicating that there might be a, a precipitous increase in the price of oil or natural gas and certainly gold and silver. Um, and that inflation was a, a far bigger concern um, than um, some of uh, the, uh, the, the quote unquote pundits uh, were uh, indicating, uh, and it was not quite as transitory. But certainly, um, these storm clouds have been on the horizon for some time, day trading and short-term trading, using good tools and, and technology, such as Dash Trader, is a good way to uh, kind of help navigate them. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, at Dash Trader TV for the Dash Newsroom reminders. Um, certainly follow us on our social media, that is on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I look forward to seeing you all in two weeks and uh, giving you another update and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.